He was born in Egypt but raised in the US and is a scientist, futurist, angel investor and award-winning author. He primarily focuses on exponential disruption, particularly in the clean energy segment. Please welcome on stage, Ramez Nam. Good morning. Thank you very much, Your Royal Highness, distinguished guests. It's an honor to be here. And today I will talk about disruption and innovation in a big scale, and then somewhat about the shipping industry and how to survive in an era of disruption. I am from Singularity University. I'm the co-chair of Energy and Environment there, where we look at the use of what we call exponential technologies to solve humanity's grand challenges, as well as to advance business. And these technologies are the digital technologies, but also robotics, biotech, energy, all of these technologies that have a massive pace of improvement in price performance, a doubling of price performance over time. And what we see in these technologies is that there's a transition from a world of building assets that are more and more capital heavy to assets that are more and more information dense. Here's a science fictional view of the future. Our future in space with giant starships that must cost trillions of dollars, large capital assets. This is a 1950s vision, bigger, bolder, more expensive. Here's what's actually happening in space. This is a CubeSat. This is a 1.3 kilo cargo that because computing has become cheaper, smaller, and less power intensive, can do what a one ton satellite was required to do 15 years ago. This is an object that is smaller, faster, cheaper, where information and information technology has replaced physical mass. And these are now for about 100,000 US dollars. You can design one, build one, launch one. There are classrooms that have done this, and there are now uh, hundreds of these launched uh, every year. Or here's another view of the transition, the democratization of technology. If you imagine the word drone 15 years ago, you might have seen something like this, a Warcraft. Uh, this price of this object, this is a MQ-9 Reaper, is classified, but it's probably about 20 million US dollars. Now, if I say drone, you probably think of this. Uh, DJI Phantom 4, for $1,000, uh, it can't do what the Reaper can do, but you can buy 20,000 of them, right? That's the democratization of technology. Technology brings prices down and then enables new tasks. What sort of new tasks? This is a company called Zipline. And Zipline operates in Rwanda. In Rwanda, only one quarter of the nation is covered by roads, and only one quarter has electricity. So if you are injured someplace, uh, you may be in a remote area, you might be out of luck, because there may not be blood kept cold of your type. But now in Rwanda, with the help of this company, anywhere in the country, medical supplies, and in particular, blood supplies of your type, can reach you in 20 minutes. This is not in a European capital. This is not in Silicon Valley. This is not even in Shanghai. This is in one of the poorest countries on planet Earth because technology gets cheaper, it gets demonetized, and it gets democratized, right? And to, this happens to any industry, no matter how physically intensive or capital intensive that industry is. Let's look at space travel. About as uh, intensive of physical infrastructure as it can possibly be. How many of you have watched a SpaceX launch? Let's watch the launch of the Falcon Heavy together. Here's the, the first Falcon Heavy launch. And this is a very exciting event, right? And they, SpaceX has made tremendous innovation. Put the, the volume up a little bit, please. Tremendous innovation in the engines, in the way that it burns fuel. They 3D print large parts of this. But the real innovation, of course, is not what happens on the way up. It's what happens on the way down. Their ability to steer these craft back to a safe landing on tiny, tiny targets. No human could have stuck that landing, right? That is software. 
Now, why does this matter? Because historically, a launch of this caliber cost 100 million US dollars. And that's because after the launch, we throw away the vehicle. Imagine that you flew from here to London, and then we took that Airbus and we threw it away at the end. What would your ticket cost? Right? Quite a lot. And so it's software, it's information technology that is bringing down the cost of this most physically demanding industry on planet Earth. Now, you probably won't ride in a spaceship anytime soon. You might eventually, but you're probably not going to soon. But you may very well, in fact, I will tell you, you will almost certainly ride in an autonomous vehicle in the next five years. These videos are from Zooks. Zooks is the number four player in autonomous vehicles, if you will. And with their technology, they're able to handle uh, all sorts of situations with the advent of deep learning and sensors and LiDAR and other players in this space. Google with Waymo has a thousand passengers using it in the suburbs of Phoenix all the time. General Motors bought Cruise for a billion dollars. Now with further investment from SoftBank and Honda, and Honda valued at $19 billion. And both of those companies are trying to br bring autonomous taxi services to full commercial use this year, and they will cut the cost of transport by half. Half the cost of a taxi or an Uber is the wages of the driver. Now, these transformations are happening because of Moore's Law, which is the exponential improvement in price performance of computing. Every decade, computers get 100 times cheaper. Now, how much cheaper do they get in 20 years? Is it 200 times? That would be a linear view. No, it's 10,000 times. How, many, how much cheaper do they get in 30 years? It's not 300 times, it's a million times. That's what we mean by exponential. So if we compare the cost of uh, ILLIAC, one of the first digital computers, which would have filled this room and drawn thousands of watts of power, to your smartphone, which fits in your pocket and draws milliwatts, if we wanted to build something with the power of your smartphone using ILLIAC technology, it would have a footprint larger than Oslo, draw more power than all of Northern Europe, and cost $100 trillion. Right? That is the technology transition that we see. And so this transition does many things. There's a framework we have of six Ds, but one thing I will illustrate is that change comes faster than expected. It is deceptive, because we expect that linear change. If it's 100 times in 10 years, it should be 200. But it's not. It's much, much, much faster. And so forecasters in every industry have been caught flat-footed. In telephony, this is Vinod Kostla, he made this chart. The uh, up and to the right yellow line is how fast mobile phones actually grew. The orange lines to the right are the consensus forecasts of telephony experts at every point. No one could believe that this exponential growth would continue, but it did. That means this is now the best time to be an entrepreneur, the best time to start something ever on human history. The time it takes to make a billion dollar company used to be 20 years, now we have startups reaching a billion dollar valuation in one year. And the population of the so-called unicorns, billion dollar companies, is more and more dense every year. And many of these will fail. Uh, some of them just don't matter. They'll go out of business. Some of this is a bubble. But many of these will succeed. And they're in every industry. Healthcare, entertainment, manufacturing, uh, transportation as well. So this is the best time to start something, but it's also the most dangerous time for incumbent businesses and industries ever. 90% of the Fortune 500 from the 50s are gone. The life expectancy of firms on the S&P 500 has dropped from 60 years to 15 years and is still dropping because more technology means a faster pace of change. There are threats for shipping in this transition. Digital manufacturing, this is a laser sintering machine. It's a 3D printer that prints in metal and it can make everything from high fashion items to some of the most demanding objects on Earth. GE, they make the blades for this, their GE 9X engine, 3D printed. They get better shapes, better performance, but they also cut their supply chain. Their ATP, their advanced turboprop engine, one third of it is 3D printed. 
There's no transportation of parts for that. Now, this is still a bit of a distant threat, but at some point, does this threaten container shipping if everyone who wants to shrink their supply chain can make more and more of their components on site? or the energy transition. We've talked about this a little bit already today. And Paul Romer is right that policy has been needed in this space. But the energy transition until, and still is needed, but until about 2015, clean energy was only deployed because of government policy. Only with subsidies could you afford to deploy solar or wind, and that has changed. In the last decade, we have seen the price of solar, wind, uh, and batteries all plunge, and we've entered a second phase around 2015, where the cost of clean energy for new solar, new wind, in some parts of the world, was cheaper than new coal or gas. The second phase, the first phase was policy dependent, the second phase is competitive for new power. Solar panels have dropped in cost by a factor of 350 over the last 40 years. And now, in more and more parts of the world, in fact, in most of the world, new solar, if you can borrow at a decent rate to build it, is cheaper than building new coal or new gas. Offshore wind, in 2015, you know, four years ago, no one thought offshore wind would ever be price competitive with fossil fuels without subsidy. But since 2017, we've seen at least half a dozen offshore projects win auctions in the North Sea at zero subsidy, at grid parity prices. And these prices are still coming down. These are not endpoint prices. All of these technologies drop in price as they grow in scale. Energy storage, the next revolution. Lithium-ion batteries, since just 2010, have dropped in price by 85%. And by 2030, they'll drop in price by another 3 to 5x. And there are other battery technologies beyond that. This transition is happening. And just like the telephony example I showed you, Forecasters are caught flat-footed. Here's the IEA's forecast for how much solar the world would deploy per year, going off to the right, uh, successive years of the world energy outlook, and how much solar the world has actually deployed. This is, it's like some analyst is looking at their past year's forecast in Excel and hitting copy, paste. We'll just use the same formula again next year. Now, no offense to the IEA, but there is a linear way of forecasting and there's the exponential that is actually happening. And this happens because they don't anticipate the price decline. Here's a forecast from the US's equivalent of the IEA. How fast will batteries drop in price? They would drop in price by a third by 2048. This was made in 2013. Here's what actually happened. So you have to bet on the innovators and not the forecasters. And now this means that we're actually entering a third phase of clean energy. Phase one was policy dependent. Phase two was competitive for new power. Phase three is disruptive to existing fossil fuel assets. Six months ago, this happened in Indiana, in the United States. Uh, which is a red state, voted for Donald Trump by 19 points, uh, has mediocre solar resources and okay wind resources. The utility there in their five-year plan, which is currently, they're currently 65% coal-powered, said it would save their customers four billion US dollars to get rid of all of that coal and replace it not even with gas, with solar, wind, batteries, and flexible demand. So this is what we see. The price of coal rises as these plants get older, and the price of new solar drops below the operating cost. And even in China, the most energy-hungry country uh, on Earth, we see the cost of coal is rising as the plants age and as air pollution restrictions uh, come into play, and the cost of wind and the cost of solar are plunging. Coal, in fact, peaked. Coal consumption around the world peaked in 2013 and has been on a plateau. But if you believe this, and McKinsey, for instance, believes this also, they say between 2025 20, and 2030, basically everywhere on planet Earth, it will be cheaper to build new solar and new wind than to operate existing coal or gas, then what we're going to see is coal demand plummet. Right. And that has an impact on this industry because the last I looked, 25% of bulk cargo was coal. Or what about oil? The same thing will happen to oil. In fact, we've already hit the peak of demand for internal combustion cars. It happened probably in 2017. 
because the auto market hit a bit of a cyclical downturn. You can all have all of my slides. Please take all the pictures you want, but you can all have them, so you can come back. The auto industry had a bit of a cyclical downturn, and at the same time, electric vehicle sales are rising 60 to 80 percent per year. Now, that's been policy-driven, and Norway has been an absolute leader, it has the highest penetration of electric vehicles of any country on Earth. But just like with solar and wind, we're entering a second phase, where on the economics, electric vehicles will win. And that's because of this. This is the engine and drivetrain of an electric vehicle, all of it. This is the engine and drivetrain of a combustion vehicle. It has 20 times the number of moving parts. So that means the, in, the electric vehicle has a much, much higher efficiency, five times the range per dollar put in. It has a much lower maintenance cost. And when you put that together, while they're more expensive up front, the lifetime cost or the four-year operational cost of an electric vehicle is already lower. So if you get into a taxi or an Uber, very soon, everywhere on Earth, they will be electric. And by 2030, as battery costs continue to drop, it won't be a 10% difference. It'll be half the price. Now, I told you autonomy cuts the price of a taxi by half, and electric now cuts the cost of electric by half. So the future of mobility may well be this. Electric autonomous robo-taxis, that is what GM with Cruise, Google with Waymo, that company Zooks and Tesla are all aiming for, and those will win on economics. Because on a cost per mile basis, we are looking at those being less than the price of owning and operating your personal vehicle, and in fact, it could go cheaper than this. And the same revolution will hit light and medium commercial trucks. This vehicle only goes 150 miles per day. And indeed, semi-trucks as well. It looks like the uh, Tesla Semi, if they deliver on time. Piper Jaffray says there will be a 2.1-year payback time to go from a diesel truck to an electric truck because the operational cost is so much lower. And that means if we add it all up, roughly two-thirds of the world's oil demand is at risk of disruption, and I believe the peak of oil demand will happen in the coming decade, possibly in the next five years. And if you want more, feel free to, to email me and I'll send you more background on that. But what does that mean for the tanker fleet? So I will close with a few lessons. What separates the companies that get disrupted and get disrupted by these pirate uh, network effect companies that Dr. Romer was talking about versus those that thrive? And there's three things that the companies that thrive do, and I encourage you in the shipping industry to undertake this. Number one is they experiment continuously. If you look at any technology company, if you go to the home page of Amazon, the structure of this page and the content of this page is not decided by Jeff Bezos or any vice president. It is decided by tens of thousands of experiments where individuals throughout the organization are empowered to try new things and see what works. It's very unlike most traditional top-down businesses. And indeed, if you look at the entire startup ecosystem, there is no king of Silicon Valley. This is robust experimentation. These are the 0.1% of startups that make it. And the way even that venture capital works is that 60% of venture capital investments fail completely. And only a small number, 6%, lead to those massive successes. So do you have the stomach and the culture in your organization to operate in this way, to empower people to try things so that you can find these few big wins? Because to do so, you must embrace the possibility and the reality of failure and do so in a way that is safe for your employees, that uh, encourages them to continue to try new things. Bezos, I've made billions of dollars of failures at Amazon. He goes on to say, companies that don't experiment and don't risk failure find themselves in a desperate situation. The only way to succeed is to risk to fail. Google celebrates, this is a public website, the Google Cemetery, they celebrate their failures. At Google X, their incubator, a team decides when they're going to fail out, and they say, we have decided it's not working. They get applause. Seth Godin, innovation expert, gives you three tips. Fail fast and cheap. And failing cheap isn't cheap. You have to build systems 
to allow experiments that can give you back data quickly and cheaply, fail often, try many things, and of course fail in a way that doesn't kill you. We too often in industry decide, here's the future. Let's spend 100 million US dollars on it. That's not the way to do it. Create sandboxes. Create ways for your employees to try things at low cost in safety. And number three, the real disruption often comes from someone moving into an adjacent sector. Everyone knows Apple is a huge success. You may not remember that 15 years ago, Apple was on the verge of failure, had 10% share in the Macintosh. They still have only 10% share in the Macintosh of the laptop market. Microsoft bailed Apple out. The way that Apple succeeded, Steve Jobs saved Apple by saying, well, our business is what it is and it's not a great business, we're going to move into an adjacency. We're going to use our technology to disrupt music. And they were up against an incredibly disruptive, competent competitor. Sony invented this, the Walkman, had the Discman, but still they said we would innovate. You can buy one song at a time, and you will have new models. And to do that, I will tell you that in addition to the change in the core of your organization, you must place people on the edge with autonomy, who can innovate without going through all the same processes and all the P&L responsibilities of your organization. And I will close at last with the words of the great Charles Darwin. He is famous for saying, uh, survival of the fittest, but he went on in life to write that it's not the strongest of the species that survives, or even the smartest, but the one that is most responsive to change the world is changing faster than ever, and I urge all of you to be the ones who are most responsive to change. Thank you very much.